essentially what Putin is saying is that um, Ukraine has never existed as a nation, uh, does not have within it the principle of statehood, and was always part of greater Russia. And that whenever Ukraine decided to say goodbye to their elder brothers in this imperial ideology, the great Russians, every time Ukraine, the Ukrainians had thought about going their own separate way, they had always fallen under the influence of Western powers hostile to Russia that used Ukraine against Russia and anti-Russia. Welcome everybody, welcome at this special lecture, the Dr. Ye Tans Lecture 2023 uh, by a special guest who will be introduced by our Rector Magnificus uh, Pamela Habibovic. I'm Rob van Duin, Studium Generale. We organized this lecture for the University of Maastricht and happy that I'm here for the over 30th time for a Tons lecture, actually. So um, I started my work at the university in 1990, so I've been to a lot and always enjoyed it. So very happy that you're all here. The lecture will take about an hour, after which there is time for some questions. And after that, we have a special drink, free drink in the rafter of this building. If you move out the hall to your right, next to the elevator to your right, for a drink to talk a bit about the topic of tonight. But please welcome Pamela Habibovic, our Rector Magnificus. Thank you very much, Rob. Good evening, uh, dear guests. A warm welcome to Maastricht University on this uh, uh, 2023 TANS lecture. And for those of you, I, I suppose everybody knows by now, but the, the Tans lecture is actually organized and established in honor of Dr. Sheng Tans, and he's a founding father of our university. And he started actually his career as a teacher of the Dutch language, uh, but then he um, continued as a politician, uh, focusing on education. And from 70 to 74, uh, he was the chairman of the committee that prepared the eight faculty of medicine in the Netherlands which now turned out to be our university. So it is thanks to, to, to him that we are standing here today. Um, but it is, of course, all about the tonight's lecturer. Um, and uh, we are very pleased to, to have you here, uh, Dr. Orlando Feiges. I just checked. I said, it's so embarrassing if your name is mispronounced. And I know that from experience, because I don't have the easiest name ever. So uh, I hope it was OK. <laughs> Dr. Fajas is a professor of history at Birkbeck College, University of London, uh, and born in 1959. He graduated with a double start first, I guess it's cum laude here, uh, from Cambridge University, where he was a lecturer in history and fellow of Trinity College from 1984 to 1999. He is the author of several uh, books on Russian history. That is why we are here uh, today, including a people's tra tragedy the Russian Revolution, from 1891 to 1924, which in 1997 received the Wolfson Prize, the NCR Book Award, the W.H. Smith Literary Award, the Longman History Today Book Prize, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. And in September, so, <laughs> well done. In September 2022, that's what we said, uh, tell to our students when they, when they get the awards. In September 2022, uh, uh, Professor Feige published the story of Russia, and I think, I see that here, so uh, I think everybody's welcome to, uh, yeah, you, you even get a free bag later on if you buy one. Uh, a history of Russia until the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, the reviews such as uh, the history book you need if you want to understand modern Russia by Anne Applebaum and the great historian at the peak of his powers by William uh, Dalrymple demonstrate the value of this book, I think. So um, 
uh, that is also why uh, we are happy to have you here today. Uh, Professor Farge inter interprets the history using a broad perspective, including social and cultural aspects. And um, uh, many say that his scientific books read actually like a novel, uh, which make them highly accessible to a broader readership. And in tonight's lecture, uh, you will unpack the ideas of the 19th century Russian imperial historiography. I'm an engineer, by the way. So uh, <laughs> I, I needed to prepare this, which continues from, to inform the Russian view of Ukraine and the West and explain their influence in the context of Russia's own experience since 1991. So um, yeah, there's nothing else I could say, I think, and we are very, very pleased to have you again and uh, look forward to hearing your lecture. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, everybody, for turning out and for giving me the honor of giving this 10th this lecture. Um, it's my second time in Maastricht. The first time, I think I was here, 2017, to talk on the centenary of the Russian Revolution. Um, tonight, I want to talk about the historical origins and mythologies of the Russian war against Ukraine. And it does come in the context of, of this book, the story of Russia, which I started as my lockdown book, um, having decided to retire. I have retired now from academic teaching. I decided to retire, and I thought at the end of my stint of 35 years, do I need to be closer to that? 35 years teaching Russian history at Cambridge and London universities. I'd come to the conclusion that we would be better off understanding where Russia is coming from in this aggressive war against Ukraine if we had taught all those years not just Russian history, but Russian historiography. Because our view of Russian history is very different from the Russians' view of their own history and of how their country fits in with the world. And um, in particular, uh, it's important to look at the historiography because history in Putin's Russia is the basis of all ideology. The ideology of this war is rooted in history. Or I should probably say historical mythology, the abuse of history. Uh, the book is in many ways um, uh, an illustration of the famous quotation by George Orwell in 1984. He who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. So the control of Russia's past, the way it's taught, presented in mass media, is absolutely crucial to understand if we want to know what's behind Putin's war against Ukraine. And that idea for the book came to me at the very moment that this happened. It's where I start the book, on the 4th of November 2016, when Putin and the Patriarch and Solzhenitsyn's wife, strangely, uh, unveiled this hideous monument, really, to the Grand Prince Equal of the Apostles, P Vladimir, um, who was this obscure um, medieval uh, prince, the Grand Prince of Kiev, who uh, uh, converted to Christianity on behalf of his people, the Rus, in 988, thereby bringing Russia into the Christian world through Byzantium. And Putin said um, in his brief speech that the Grand Prince Vladimir was uh, the founder of the modern Russian state. Now, that struck me as if not a declaration of war against Ukraine, it already struck me then in 2016 as you know, putting up a warning sign of what was going to happen. Because effectively what he was saying is that there's a straight line from the foundation of Kievan Rus in the first millennium to the modern Russian state. Ukrainian history counts for nothing because it's all basically Russian history. And um, the problem with this particular uh, monument is that there already was one to the Grand Prince Volodymyr, uh, 
as the Ukrainians call him. So you have Vladimir Putin against Volodymyr Zelensky, and you have the Grand Prince Vladimir against the Grand Prince Volodymyr. Well, this in Kiev was erected in 1853. I think it's a much nicer statue myself. Um, and it's at a time then when obviously Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire, but this statue already by, certainly by the 1905 revolution and certainly by 1917, had already become the focus of Ukrainian national feeling. And in 1991, when Ukraine got its independence from the Soviet Union, it became a great emblem of Ukrainian independence. And when uh, Putin unveiled that monument in Moscow, Pyotr Poroshenko, the Ukrainian president at that time, tweeted immediately, you know, that we, this is the real Vladimir or Volodymyr, and you are, you are stealing our history. And for Poroshenko, this uh, grand prince represented the birth of the Ukrainian modern state. Um, not only that, but he went on to tweet later and indeed make a speech saying that the uh, Grand Prince Volodymyr had, by taking Ukraine into the world of Byzantium, it had made for modern Ukraine a European choice. So you have two, in other words, two nationalist foundation mythologies in conflict from this moment. The Russian which goes directly from Kyiv to modern Moscow, um, uh, in which Ukraine features as nothing but a region, and the Ukrainian story, which goes straight from Kyiv to the modern Ukrainian state, um, which is part and always was part of Europe in this Ukrainian mythology. Well, um, both are really untenable, even absurd historical propositions. Here's a map of uh, Kievan Rus uh, in the 11th century. And you can see in the dark green patch towards the bottom there that there was a core territory, um, but I wouldn't call it even so much as a state at that point. It was um, a tax collecting, uh, tribute collecting entity uh, of warriors. Um, and uh, in the lighter green, you have the whole extent of the collection of principalities that made up the uh, kingdom of, 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 of Kiev. And it includes, in today's terms, parts of Russia, parts of Ukraine. The uh, borders of Russia and Ukraine have changed, particularly Ukraine, as we will see this evening, changed many, many times. So there's no fixed sense of um, where Ukraine even is. Um, and indeed, the word, which for the Russians means, or indeed in all the Slav languages, just means borderland, the edge, Ukraina, but doesn't appear in print So uh, until the 12th century, a print, I mean in a manuscript. It doesn't appear written down in any official document of any sort until, until uh, in fact, the th early 13th century. So to talk about a Ukrainian state in 988 makes no sense whatsoever. So in other words, we have two nationalist mythologies at loggerheads here. Um, the Ukrainian one is questionable. Um, the Russian one is questionable. In fact, you know, ethnically, you would be hard pressed to de define who, who the Rus were, who the inhabitants of this area were. Um, what we know of the Rus is very little. They were probably Vikings who sailed in through the Baltic Sea down the rivers to trade with Byzantium, picking up slaves from the far north and furs from dealers, bringing them in from the north and Siberia, taking them down through the Dnieper River as far as uh, Constantinople, where they could trade those furs and slaves uh, for silver and other items that we now find on archaeological digs as far afield as, as Yorkshire. You probably find them in fields around Maastricht somewhere. But um, this then was a, um, a multi-ethnic uh, 
trading community. We can't really say whether they're Ukrainians or Russians. Um, they were um, made up of many constituent parts which archaeologists today, in fact, mostly would trace to the steppe lands of the South and the East. So they, they're basically nomadic peoples and who join these trading warrior elites to make a bit of money and, and join that, that civilization based on, on the river trade. So, um, in other words, uh, we're dealing here with, with a sort of idea of nation which is as meaningful to today's Russia or Ukraine as, say, saying that King Alfred, which is a story we have of an ancient Saxon king in English folklore, you know, there's a story most children are told about how he burnt the cakes. I mean, it's that level of, of storytelling. It's as if to say that he was the founder of modern Britain somehow. It makes, makes no sense whatsoever. But um, as a lineage of legitimacy, which is based on Christianity, the, the determination of the Russian uh, uh, Tsars, the first of whom was Ivan IV in the middle 16th century, to claim descendants from Kiev and Rus was very powerful. Now, um, to get to that point, we have to firstly realize that what happened to Kiev and Rus in the early 13th century was that Kiev itself in 1240 was ransacked by the Mongols as the Mongol horsemen swept across um, the Eurasian steppe. That arrow there is not actually the Mongols, it's the um, uh, various other tribes, like the, the, the Polovtsians, who raided uh, settled peoples on that steppe. But um, in 1237 and uh, onwards, uh, the whole of the western Eurasian steppe was taken over by the Mongols, who ruled it indirectly for the next 230 years, and cut Kievan Rus into half. And so this adds another dimension to the nationalist mythologies at play in this war, because uh, the western part um, effectively what you would call their Galicia Volinia and west of Kiev became part of the uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, in fact, if I go to the next map, you'll see that the, the areas of, um, if you can get your bearings from Crimea and then work up, you'll be best off. Um, the areas of, of uh, uh, the Duchy of Lithuania in brown and Poland in yellow um, that took over the protection of Western Ukraine in today's terms from the Mongols gave to West Ukraine a completely different historical trajectory from Mongol Rus, as the Ukrainians call Muscovy. In the West, under the protection of the Poles and Lithuanians, obviously a big Catholic influence, which partly moves into Western Ukraine, you also have the development of effectively a constitutional monarchy by the Renaissance period. Whereas the eastern areas of Kievan Rus, which fell under the domination eventually of Muscovy on, on, on the green area there on the right, which is from the mid 16th century, um, you have a completely set, different set of traditions. Patrimonialism is a very uh, strong element of the autocracy there, very much a legacy of the Mongol methods of rule. Um, and um, you, you, you don't have the same development of institutions at all. Um, but we can go into that uh, at a later point. The point I want to make here is that for Ivan IV, crowned in the mid-16th century, 1547, he wanted to establish himself as an, as, as an emperor on the same basis as the great powers of Western Europe. He was thinking of competing, you know, with Sweden, with, the, with, 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 with England. And um, uh, he wanted to be an emperor, and so he claimed this title Tsar. Uh, 
on top of the title Grand Prince, which just means Caesar, but it means that he needed to establish a link back to the Byzantine Empire and claim Kiev as the source of the legitimacy, the Christian legitimacy of Muscovy. It was a complete invention. But, I mean, and a good emblem of that invention is this, the cap of Monomach, which became the basic headgear of all Tsars until the 19th century, when they adopted a more traditional European crown. And the cap of Monomach was, the legend went, that it had been given by the Byzantine emperor, um, Constantine the Ninth Monomachus, to the Grand Prince Vladimir Monomachus of Kiev who supposedly was his grandson when he ascended to the throne. But the problem is he ascended to the throne when he was only two years old, so this story doesn't really um, carry much weight. And in any case, the cap didn't come from Constantinople. It's uh, almost certainly, um, it's now believed, it was a gift from an Uzbek Khan to um, the, the Grand Prince uh, Vladimir and possibly not even Monomach. But that's the idea then, to establish this lineage that Kievan Rus is the base of, basis of Muscovy is the basis of modern Russia. Um, and it was reinvented along the way many times over. So a whole series of 17th century monks, the most important of whom was Inokenti Gizel, who was actually a Prussian, who argued that, um, that there was this, this, this direct line of descendants uh, linking uh, the Tsars of, of Muscovy to, to uh, Byzantium and eventually even to, to the great Roman emperors. That was the idea. And um, that uh, imperial idea, um, full of mythologies, as I, as I, as I hope uh, you, you now get, um, uh, is where we are really in the middle of the 16th century. But again, you know, the borders change. We can't really say anything for sure about, um, about statehood at this point on the Ukrainian steppe. And you'll see from this map that um, much of today's Ukraine is not either in um, Russian or Muscovite or Polish-Lithuanian control. The steppe lands of the south are what was called then the wild lands. They became... Uh, they were, there were no landowners there. Muscovy had expanded by rewarding its servitors with land, but they hadn't done anything about conquering the Western, uh, the, the, the Western Eurasian steppe, the, the, the white areas, because they were still overrun by nomadic tribes and horsemen who were dominant. And then in the south there, you had the Crimean Khanate, who was the, which was the last of the Mongol Khanates, and to the east, the uh, Khanates of Kazan and Astrakhan, which Ivan IV uh, defeated as Russia pushed east, but the Crimean Khanate in the south remained right until the end of the 18th century when Catherine the Great annexed that territory, which is in the white there, which became known as New Russia. Well, that's also a problematic area we need to return to. But for the moment, you can't see any Ukrainian nationhood here in terms of um, any geographical designations. But what you can see uh, emerging from, this, this, uh, from these wild lands are proto-states, hetmanates of the Cossacks. The Cossacks are not Ukrainian or Russian necessarily, but they are orthodox. And like the original settlers of the Ukrainian steppe, they were multi-ethnic probably, because what Cossack meant was to be a brigand. It was to be a bandit. To go Cossacking meant to live by being a mercenary soldier and raiding settled communities. Um, uh, and they took part in the conquest of Siberia on that basis. Um, and uh, here we have... The, the, the most important of the, of the sort of uh, proto-states founded by um, the uh, Cossacks of the Zaporizhzhia Hetmanate um, uh, in, that, in the area of yellow surrounded by the red border 
which emerged in the, in the late 16th, early 17th century. And at that time, you can begin to see in Cossack discourse mention of the word Ukraine. They think of themselves as Ukraine. But what they thought of themselves by that word, we're not quite sure. But they used the word for sure. And in 1654, um, uh, they came, they came uh, to the Tsar Alexei in Russia asking for protection against the Poles who were trying to um, um, both uh, uh, impose Catholicism in the area, but also take away many of the Cossack privileges and absorb the Cossack hetmanate into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Well, uh, Tsar Alexei didn't want a war with the, with the Poles, um, but he was persuaded by his patriarch, Kirill, and the influence of the church here, I think, is significant because it's really still there today, um, that he should go to war to defend the Orthodox Cossacks against the Polish Catholics. And on that basis, a union took place between the Tsar and the Cossacks, which effectively meant, the, um, in the long term, the subjugation of the Cossack independent statehood, such as it had existed at that point. Although, and this is where, again, the foundation mythologies are in conflict, for the Ukrainian nationalists, this Cossack hetmanate is the Ur state. It's the founding statehood of modern Ukraine. Which is one of the reasons why you have Cossack insignia on the Ukrainian flag. Well, there's a problem with that, because the Cossacks... Um, were not really nationally minded. They were basically only interested in defending Cossack freedoms. They held in contempt the peasants. And they killed Jews in that war um, against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Cossacks killed around 60,000 Jews. So um, how you would build a, a nation based on Cossack unity when uh, the majority of the population are peasants and you have a significant Jewish minority would be a problem. Okay, let's move on because if uh, the 4th of November 2016 and the founding of this uh, Kievan Rus sets up two completely divergent nationalist mythologies, you then have the problem which, for me, was a declaration of war. It's certainly a historical justification for the war when in July 2021, Putin published this essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. We think it was by Putin, but it, it could have been by Medinsky, who was the culture minister, or it could have been by Yuri Kovalchuk, who was uh, is one of P Putin's sort of best mates, of one of the oligarchs, and they like talking history together. The history in it's pretty bad, but the argument is very simple and fits this nationalist mythology very clearly. Essentially, what Putin is saying is that um, Ukraine has never existed as a nation, uh, does not have within it the principle of statehood and was always part of greater Russia. And that whenever Ukraine decided to say goodbye to their elder brothers in this imperial ideology, the great Russians, so the Ukrainians are called the little Russians, and the Russians are called the Great Russians. Every time Ukraine, the Ukrainians had thought about going their own separate way, they had always fallen under the influence of Western powers hostile to Russia that used Ukraine against Russia and anti-Russia. That's his argument. So the Swedes and the Poles in the 17th century, the, the Germans, and the Austrians in the 19th century, then the Germans in the First World War, and then the Germans again in the Second World War, the Allies in the Civil War in between, they'd all used Ukrainian nationalism against Russia. And that is exactly what the Americans and the Europeans were doing from 2014 when they um, 
uh, for Putin, you know, hijacked or used the Maidan revolution to impose a, a Western-oriented government on Kiev. And they were doing so in order to attack Russia. So all the arguments about you know, NATO military infrastructure moving into Ukraine were connected with this historical argument that if Ukraine fell out of Russian control, it would become a hostile anti-Russian force in the hands of the, of the West. The other thing he argued um, is that Ukraine never had any statehood until it was given one by Lenin in 1922 when they formed the Soviet Union. And um, the argument that he made, he didn't spell it out, but essentially what you have to understand is he said, uh, the problem is Lenin. It's not the Soviet Union. The problem was Lenin's conception of the Soviet Union, which was to have a federation of sovereign republics who would have, albeit only nominally, um, the right to secede from the Soviet Union. So that's effectively the right that the Ukrainians used in 1991. And the reason why he was critical of Lenin is because he, uh, Putin, by implication, he didn't spell it out, would have much preferred Stalin's solution for the structure of the Soviet Union, which was not to give uh, the founding member states, which included Ukraine, the, um, uh, the right to secede or even sovereign republic status, but to make them autonomous regions of Russia. So they would only have some cultural freedoms. They wouldn't have a right to secede. Um, so in other words, Russia would be, uh, the Soviet Union would be much closer to the original Russian Empire than any genuine federation, which Lenin, albeit belatedly, I think, began to realize in the last years of his life, um, needed rethinking and fighting against this great Russian chauvinism that he saw Stalin, ironically, the Georgian, implementing through his plans for the Soviet Union. So the other thing that he said then is that if, I mean, um, he, Putin said that the problem of the, of the Soviet Union as Lenin formed it are twofold. Firstly, that it had this right to secede. Um, secondly, it was given too much land. Let's just have a look at this quickly before we move on, because here in this map we have... We have, if anyone's read Bulgakov's White Guard, this is the Ukraine of the White Guard set in Kiev, 1918. Um, the um, Rada, the parliament in Kiev, has declared its independence from, from, from Petersburg, Petrograd, in 1917, as many areas did, and is claiming this territory. But as you can see, all around the um, boundaries of this uh, Ukrainian People's Republic, there are also breakaway areas like the Odessa Soviet Republic, the Donetsk Krivoyrog Soviet Republic, and so on. So it's a fairly chaotic and fluid situation. I mean, Kiev itself changed hands 16 times during the Russian Civil War. So borders um, were extremely fluid. Um, but for Putin, the problem um, is, firstly, if I got the right map, firstly, the problem is, let's first look at the, this is the Soviet Ukraine Republic as it existed after the Second World War, which shows the newly conquered or re-annexed areas of um, Galicia, Volhynia, Ruthenia, um, parts of what today are the Moldavian uh, Republic. So, um, uh, that, um, uh, and to that, of course, is added Khrushchev's gift of Crimea to the Ukrainian Republic in 1954. Putin says they got too much because basically, oops, what's happened there? Putin says they got too much because firstly, in 19, if you think of it, in 1918, um, uh, when they had their own self-declared republic, they didn't have quite a lot of areas. They certainly didn't have that area to the south, the Tauride Soviet Socialist Republic. It was short-lived, but which before 1917 had been New Russia, Novorossiya. 
So in other words, Putin ended up by saying in that essay, if Ukraine wants to secede from the from, if it wanted to secede from the Soviet Union, and we, we fully recognise its right to do, it should have left with what it came with. Which is highly ambiguous, and I think deliberately ambiguous. Did he mean by that they should leave only with what they had declared theirs um, at this point, in other words, they should give back the Donbass and New Russia and Crimea. Or did he mean it had never existed because this was an artificial creation, therefore it should leave with nothing. In other words, like Israel for the Palestinians, go into the oblivion of erasure from the map of the world. So... Um, that was left ambiguous, and I think deliberately so, because I think we still don't know how much of Ukraine does he want. Does he want the Donbass and Crimea and New Russia, which is all presently occupied by the Russian forces? Or does he want the whole of Ukraine? Not clear. But we can see then that this is, um, this is a, a very poisonous historical mythology which uh, is used by Putin as a historical justification for the invasion, but it's not enough on its own. And of course, ah, it's nonsense. It's, no, we're talking about ancient history here, because since 1991, Ukraine has been an independent state, just like Israel has been since 1947, recognized by the United Nations. So, you know, what are we talking about here? We're, we're talking about the complete abuse of history for an, a, a war of aggression, an imperialist war against a former colony, effectively. Well, so it's not sufficient to understand the war, it's only background. So we have to move from mythology into how those mythologies are used in the context of post-1991 politics. And I think that is where it starts. I think if you look at the Putin um, clique that has driven this war and been behind Putin's imperialist ideology for the last 15 years, then um, they're basically all people who, at their mid-career, early to mid-career, you know, Putin was a KGB officer in, in Dresden um, and witnessed the collapse of communism across Europe and experienced it as a catastrophe. And then it imploded into the Soviet Union itself. And they saw their bosses, their elders, as having effectively thrown away an empire. And who were they going to blame for that? Well, above all, they blamed Kravchuk, who became the first Ukrainian president, and Yeltsin, the first Russian president for basically pulling the plug on the Gorbachev's nine plus one agreement to renegotiate some sort of federal union of the former Soviet republics who wanted to. But Ukraine said no, they had voted for independence, that was the end of the Soviet Union. So there's a certain amount of payback against Ukraine for having, in their eyes, really been the key factor in the defeat of the Soviet Union, which they see as a catastrophe. Because in the 1990s, Russia was weak, no one really consulted it, there was the humiliation of being pushed around by Clinton, uh, not even consulted in the NATO bombing of Kosovo and so on. The weakness of Russia was a humiliation for their sense of the greatness of Russia that they wanted to champion. People, individual people, you know, saw it as uh, in, in similar terms. And then in terms of this, you know, the elite, they saw color revolutions as they saw it, democratic Western-backed um, revolutions against uh, dictators um, uh, emerging on the borders of, of, of Russia itself in Ukraine in 2004. 
uh, when Moscow intervened to uh, uh, try and fix that election, but then the Ukrainians in their first moment of resistance really um, fought back and, um, and had elections recast and they were won by the, by the pro-Western candidate in the end. But that was Russia's attempt to contain what they saw as the Ukrainian problem. And all the Russians saw that. I mean, Yeltsin, Gorbachev, everybody in the Russian political establishment saw in the 1990s that Ukraine was the problem. Ukraine was the red line for them. That if Ukraine uh, spilled out of Russian control, it would create problems for Russia itself. So that's really the, um, the, the context in which you get this nationalist, imperialist movement coalescing around Putin in the 2000s. And I do see it, I mean, it is driven by Putin. I mean, it, it's certainly driven by him in terms of the, um, of the uh, you know, ideology of restoring a great Russia, the Russian world project. All of that came to the fore from 2012, largely as a reaction against the uh, democratic demonstrations in Moscow. That was his way of clamping down on, on, on democratic movements or the color revolution, as he would see it spreading into Russia. And instead of that, we got with his imperial ideology, we got, we got the stress on traditional values, we got the idea that Russia was a civilization of higher spiritual values to the decadent West, that, um, that you know, the West was, was, all it cared about was its own egotistic materialistic needs and it was completely obsessed with sort of LGBT rights and all of this was, was a decadent um, evil phenomenon which Russians needed protection from. And at the heart of that idea of Russia's traditional values was also something which is very much in the fore of Russian propaganda during this war, namely that unlike the Western people, Russians live for a higher purpose. They can make sacrifices for the state's goals. They are special people. And that um, uh, fed into it, the ideology of the Russian world, which became, and I think still is, at the heart of this uh, almost messianic imperialism that Putin promotes. The idea that Russia is a special civilization, multi-ethnic, as Russia is itself, that has a mission to protect all the Orthodox or all the Russian speakers now um, who may be beyond the borders of Russia. Because as Putin said in that famous speech of 2005 when he declared the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest political tragedy of the 20th century, he said, in the same breath, I mean, people never quote it, but it's the same sentence. He directly went on to say that for Russia itself, it was a particular tragedy because tens of millions of our, our citizens were left outside of Russia. So this is some idea that we have um, a right, indeed, an obligation to save the Russian speakers abandoned in Ukraine which of course then became the whole argument for uh, Russian intervention from 2014 onwards, that they had to protect the Russian speakers from genocide, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, that ideology coalesced over a long period, and as I've suggested, it is really about history. There's no, you couldn't sell an ideology like that. I mean, it's pretty wacky. It's very religious. It's very, it's got all sorts of ideas of Carl Schmitt in there and Dugin's Eurasianist ideas, all of which we can talk about later. But, you know, it would be a hard sell ideologically. But the great channel for selling it, as in all ideological change in modern Russia, it comes through history. Now, the, the essay that Putin wrote... In, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it comes through history in the sense that it's promoted through all sorts of propaganda channels, this same message. And it has traction, it has 
some appeal and make some sense to most Russians. That is our problem. That's the problem of how you, you can defeat Putin, but how do you de-Putinize Russia? And the problem is how Russians understand their history. Because what Putin argued in that essay of 2021 is fairly standard 19th century Russian imperial historiography. Which is why I thought we would have been better off teaching the historiography along with the history. You can find it in Karamzin, you can find it in Kluchevsky. You know, take any basic uh, 19th century Russian history book and it will tell you that Ukraine is basically part of greater Russia, etc., etc. So, um, that, that um, uh, historical interpretation not only dominated the 19th century world, it effectively becomes the core of history teaching from the late 1930s because Stalin adopts it. He adopts this Russian imperial vision. He just cloaks it in the Soviet Union. In the 1990s, it's true, you had a short period when schools were allowed to even write their own textbooks or use whatever textbooks they wanted. But the first thing Putin did on coming to power was to set up much tighter state control of what was taught in schools. So you had a committee from 2001, then in 2007 you had um, a united mandatory historical textbook, mandatory. You couldn't teach history outside of the parameters set by this uh, series of textbooks. And uh, the Russian Historical Society, which was, is headed still by Sergei Narishkin, who's basically Russia's chief spy, um, and another sort of history buff, like fancies himself as a historian, that now has complete you know, domination of how history is taught. And it's the same old narrative of, uh, of you know, the West is trying to destroy Russia, the West will use um, Ukraine against Russia, Russia needs a strong state, a strong leader in order to repel the hostile West. That is the story. And now, I mean, since literally la uh, last month, yeah, September 2023, all high schools now in Russia have the same textbook. And the textbook has on its front cover a picture of the Kerch Bridge, yeah, connecting Russia with Crimea. And, um, you know, it has the usual historical story, you know, that basically Ukraine, modern Ukraine, is a neo-Nazi state and is trying to destroy Russia. Um, so this message um, has been on, t on tap for a long time. There's been a long period of, of ideological preparation of the population for this war on the basis of their understanding of history. And it, it's the history they learnt at school. It's the history they've seen in films. I mean, just think about it. In 2015, I think they had a national poll in Russia. Who was the greatest Russian who ever lived? And, well, some people think the answer was the real winner was Stalin, but they suppressed that, and they made the real winner Alexander Nevsky. Well, people know nothing about Alexander Nevsky. He's this 13th century prince who led the resistance of the Russians against the Teutonic Knights trying to crusade Russia. But what people know about Alexander Nevsky is what they've seen in Eisenstein's film, right? Which is Stalinist nationalist propaganda. So... It feeds this whole story that we're threatened by the West. We're threatened by the West. We need a strong leader. We need a great leader who will be a saint um, to, to defend us against the hostile West. So that's, the, that's again, this constantly repeated story. Um, even, you know, even the way the war is taught. I mean, they, they date the war, obviously, from 1941. So for them, it's a, a Western or German fascist invasion of the Soviet Union being repelled. They don't see, they, they completely skate over the period of 1939 to 41 when obviously Stalin was in alliance with Hitler. But it means that they see the war in completely different terms from the way we see the, the war. 
And moreover, they feel huge resentment that the West doesn't give the Soviet Union or Russia the credit it deserves for having won the war. And all that's another story, but it does feed this resentment sense of uh, not being given the respect Russia deserves by the West. So why then does this have so much uh, traction among the Russian population and what does that mean? It does because it fits their interpretation of history, the way they've been taught history, the way they've understood their history through film, fiction, um, and so on. And of course, it for anyone over the age of 30, it feeds, it, it, it feeds off their experience of the Cold War, when the whole population was prepared ideologically to see the West as a hostile force. Uh, and it works because basically the propaganda is really effective and it's constant. I mean, for the last 10 years, Russian television has been filled with historical nonsense about Ukraine as a Nazi state, um, et cetera, et cetera. And when you get that much absolute, you know, absolute control of the mass media by this single narrative, banging on, banging on the whole time, it's very easy to succumb to it. I mean, how many people believe, you know, the Trumpian theory about the stolen election? I think there was about 40% of Americans did at some point. So this isn't a particularly Russian problem. It's a problem of any society where fake news and the control of the media are in the hands of bad people. So the other reason I think we have to confront why this message has traction among the Russian population is because their own experience of the 1990s was so negative. Russia had a terrible time in the 90s. The economy collapsed, there was hyperinflation. At that point, stupidly, they decided to privatize virtually all medium and uh, sized state enterprises through a voucher system. People didn't know what vouchers were. They sold them for a bottle of vodka. There went their savings. Um, and many people found it very difficult to adapt to the new market system. They saw just corruption, criminality. They didn't feel it was democracy at work. In fact, they called it dermocratia instead of democratia. Dermocratia meaning shitocracy. Sorry, but that's what they called it. And I think on top of all that was a genuine sense that Russia had been humiliated treated as a defeated power. I think that did feed down to ordinary Russians. That was part of the shame that they felt in Yeltsin, this, you know, the, the shenanigans, his weakness, uh, Russia's uh, retreat before Western uh, dictates as Russians saw it. I remember going to, uh, it was before a, before a Champions League final in Moscow uh, and taking some friends visiting to the uh, Novodievichy uh, cemetery where Yeltsin was, is buried. And I asked one of the guards, where's, where's Yeltsin? And he said, Yeltsin, Vash. Yeltsin's yours. He's not ours. And that sense of what is ours, what is yours is very strong here too. I mean, I would characterize, I would characterize the war of aggression against Ukraine as a post-imperial war in which they're punishing a former colony for having the audacity to want to be part of Europe, for having a better living standard, for having a greater sense of individual liberty, human rights. They don't want that. They want to make them nash. You don't go there, you belong to us. And that sense is also deeply rooted in many Russian people because as they did growing up, living in the Soviet Union, there were no boundaries between, it made no difference whether you were in Russia or Ukraine. Uh, it was all one country. No one ever thought this country was gonna break up. And people had relatives and friends and the economies were interconnected. So you have this real tragedy now of families being completely divided. 
not only on ethnic lines, but on ideological lines, with some seeing the war for what it is, mostly now abroad, and their parents, quite often, still supporting the war. So, uh, five more minutes. I'd like to talk about how I think this war will end. Maybe. <laughs> I, I've, I finished this book in November. I got with COVID and the war and everything. My dates are getting... I, 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 was it November 20... 21, when the build-up was happening, wasn't it? So the, I finished this when the build-up was happening. And I said at that point, they may make an incursion into Ukraine, but I, I don't think Russia is strong enough to conquer the whole of Ukraine. Actually, now, we think of it, that's probably about right. Um, but um, because the war then, the invasion took place, I said to the Polish, look, we got to, we, I've, got, I've got to have some time to... to, 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 to um, uh, write uh, a final chapter and, that, and so I, I, I gave it to the publisher 20th of April when you know obviously the blitzkrieg attempt on Kiev had failed and they were regrouping in the east and, and at that point I thought you know there, obviously there are three possible scenarios as there still are a Ukrainian victory whatever that means um, which I felt was always the most the least likely unfortunately um, a long stalemate war almost inevitable, it seemed to me, which I think is still more or less inevitable, and then a Russian victory, whatever that means. Um, and I think a Russian victory, unfortunately, is um, tragically looking more likely. Um, although, obviously, we need to define what, what we mean by that victory. At what point could any negotiations be meaningful with a man like Putin? So the reasons why I would have this pessimistic view, I'm afraid, are that essentially I think Putin launched this war on the assumption that Ukraine means more to Russia than it does to the West. Simple as that. The Russians will go on fighting for this longer than the West will go on supporting Ukraine. Time is on Russia's side. It has a bigger population, and the Ukrainians are already finding it increasingly hard to mobilize people to go and fight. They're into their 40-year-olds now, and a lot of the corruption that Ukraine has to deal with is about the corruption around avoiding fighting. And they have more resources. Um, and they're now spending estimates of up to 40% of all public spending now is going on the war. 40% Soviet levels of expenditure on the military. And I think they could go higher. They could go to 60% before they had um, any problems domestically, I think. Um, well, we had hopes... Uh, in the summer about the Ukrainian counteroffensive, Some people were quite naive, you know, the Russia would collapse. Um, I even thought, hopefully, that, you know, there might be a small collapse of a front and maybe these partisans we were hearing about might disaffect more and more soldiers, um, you know, uh, in the Russian army and that might, you know, lead to something like 1917 again. But that's looking extremely unlikely. Um, the Russian defences, you know, at some points, these, these mined areas are a kilometre deep um, and positioned so that the Ukrainians have to approach those areas across open fields with the Russians in, in forests. So extremely hard for the Ukrainians. And it's not surprising that the counteroffensive of the summer has, been, has achieved so little. At the rate it's going, or has gone, it would, you know, it would take at least 10 years for the Ukrainians to cut the land corridor and get to the Azov Sea or the Black Sea. I don't think they can do it, unfortunately, without a massive increase in Western military aid. But at 
so far, Western military aid has come out of existing stocks. The Russians are ramping up military production, and the West isn't. The Ukrainians are doing their best, but on their own, they don't have the capacity. And I think that essentially he thinks that they won't last, that the West won't last the course because basically Western people are decadent. They really only care about themselves. If they get their, you know, delivery delivered, if their mobile phones work, they don't really care about anywhere else. And maybe he's right. I mean, the, 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 the polling, you know, I mean, obviously now with the whole added dimension of the Israel-Palestine war, or Israel-Hamas war, which could escalate, you know, the attention and the military aid that can go uh, to Ukraine is going to be diminished. And the appetite for Ukraine has gone. I mean, I think Zelensky's uh, mood must be very dispirited. Uh, I mean, he's doing his best. He's a fantastic hero. But, you know, his last trip to Washington was not a success. Washington, which provides sort of 80% of aid going to Ukraine, has no more patience. They always took the view, I think even in the Biden administration, they took the view that um, future support was going to depend on the success of this counteroffensive, and the counteroffensive has not succeeded. So they'll be looking for other options. But where they can come from with Putin in power, I don't know. Not only is Putin counting on Western war fatigue, He's counting on splits in the Western alliance, and they too, unfortunately, are emerging. The Russians have been supporting far-right populist nationalist parties across Europe for a long time, and they are now beginning, if not winning elections, as they did in Slovakia, then giving pro-European parties like Tusks in Poland a run for their money. And elsewhere in Italy, we have a, we have a far-right government, unfortunately, uh, fortunately so far, um, has stood firm on Ukraine. But, you know, Putin, uh, it's often missed, actually, but I remember seeing Putin on television. He was visiting a far, um, far eastern um, uh, space center, and he was speaking... I don't know if he thought he was off camera or on camera to sort of, you know, his entourage of people from the space center. Uh, and he said to them, perfectly audible, but not picked up by journalists, that the reason why they were going to win this war is because it was, the war was going to create a huge problem of famine in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, therefore, there would be a massive migration problem for Europe. So he's weaponized everything. He's weaponized food supplies, he's weaponized fuel supplies, he's weaponized the migrant crisis, um, and things unfortunately are going his way. Because we are tired of Ukraine. We want the problem solved. Moreover, he's um, winning what we call the Global South. He's uh, got effectively China on his side, I mean, uh, you know, being careful, but I'm sure that a lot of the um, production they're giving to the Russians is usable as components for armaments. They've got North Korea, they've got Libya, they've got Syria, they've got this whole band of African states where Wagner has been active on their side. Uh, they recently had the Taliban in Moscow, and of course, only a few days ago, they had Hamas representatives in Moscow. And this war in the Middle East is only uh, driving further apart the uh, perspectives of the anti-American global south and the Western democracies. Um, ultimately, I think, uh, I will close, but ultimately, I think, 
that the war cannot... I mean, I think we have to keep supporting Ukraine for as long as they can continue fighting. Uh, and until they themselves are ready to negotiate a peace, which may have to mean land for peace, because ultimately, you know, you need a viable Ukraine. What Putin will not, what Putin cannot conquer, he will destroy. He will bombard civilian infrastructure, dams, electricity supply to make Ukraine dysfunctional as a state if he can't conquer it. So at some point, you need peace to build a vi to, to pr retain a viable Ukraine. But it doesn't seem, I don't think you can have a peace with either Putin or the Putin regime in power. Putin, you know, is uh, not to be trusted, obviously. So any peace would be a little bit like the Israelis having a ceasefire now. I mean, it would just give time to the enemy to, 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 to rearm and prepare for a new offensive because he is that determined to de destroy Ukraine. So um, we need a revolution, effectively. Where is it going to come from? I can't see it happening in the... Sh in, you know, it's not something one can see happening very easily. I don't see splits emerging in the, in the elite. I mean, the Prigozhin mutiny, it could well have been a concerted thing. It could well have been organized by the FSB to some extent. I certainly think Prigozhin fell into a trap. And it, one thing is for sure that, you know, no one joined him and he ended up with, you know, obviously we know what happened to him, but then his whole movement is wound up. The state takes over the, the Wagner group effectively and uh, its soldiers are effectively brought under the control of the Ministry of Defence. So a sort of collective Putin emerged out of that crisis and the regime came out of it stronger. And I think... The regime now is a lot stronger than it was at the beginning of the war for a number of reasons. All the opposition has been imprisoned or frightened abroad. We have over a million Russians in Georgia, Kazakhstan, the Baltic states fleeing. And any opposition that remained in Russia is either imprisoned or too terrified to speak out. And that's not because they're cowards. It's because if you come from a country that had Stalin, if you grew up in a family that had Stalin, in a society in which you had these shockwaves of terror put through the body politic periodically in the 1930s, 1940s, and so on, you, you, you know, not, you, you, you just learn to go along with the authorities. So I don't think that many people actively support the war, maybe only 20%. But very few people actively oppose the war. And the vast majority of people just go along with it. My country, right or wrong, or they don't want to speak out, or they don't have opinions, or they, they just, they don't, they want to remain passive on this situation. So, for all of those reasons, I think that the regime is stable and strong, determined to see this war through to an end. That leaves a huge challenge for the West, which must support Ukraine. We are, I believe, at, you know, Biden's term is at the right one, an inflection point in history. Because if Russia wins in Ukraine and destroys that country, then we're in a complete free-for-all. And his ultimate aim is to destroy the international system based on law, on the United Nations, on everything that's been built since 1945. So... We can't afford to lose this war. I'm not saying that because I think that he will, if he conquers Ukraine, he'll march on 
Poland and the Baltic states, I don't think that they are capable of doing that. You know, 18 months into this war, they've only taken 18% of Ukrainian territory. They're not strong enough to take much more. But it's the principle, and we're seeing now, you know, with Iran es possibly escalating this war, that we are in danger of going back to a 19th century imperial free-for-all where might is right. And for that reason, we must really, you know, stand by Ukraine. We must really stand by them and support them for as long as we can, because... Our deliveries, our mobile phones, our um, comfortable living standards and principles of civility and tolerance and the democratic institutions and principles that we live by are all at threat. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, Orlando Vajas. Um, there's one hand <laughs> already, of course, and a second one. My colleague Jaap Jans uh, has a microphone there too. Okay. Uh, well, the war is often called an uh, unprovoked war. Yes, just as it comes out of the blue. But uh, another theory is that the USA and NATO provoked this war, and in fact from 2007 on, yes, and then you have uh, 2014 and so on. So they have make a lot of work of, of it, in fact. And um, uh, always said uh, Ukraine must win the war, you said it in fact uh, also, but if uh, Ukraine loses the war, mean, that means probably that the USA has lost the war. And if the USA lost the war against Russia, Russia the USA makes the same fault as Napoleon did and as Hitler did. So, uh, and that is then the fate of Biden, but also of the USA, and also of Europe. Okay, so well... Was the NATO. Uh, what do you think about this? Well, I politely disagree from the perspective I think you're putting forward in your question. I mean, NATO expansion was a provocation, but I don't think... I mean, I agree with George Kennan, who said so at the time that there would be a backlash from Russia. I think it was badly handled. Um, and I certainly think that the, that the Americans and Europeans waded in to the situation of 2014 in a way that was badly advised. But even so, I don't think that any of that is um, a provocation in the sense that it can be used to justify or explain the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Because, um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a provocative thing to expand NATO infrastructure to Russia's borders, especially when you make it clear to Russia, as Clinton or Bush did to, uh, to Putin, that Russia won't be allowed to join NATO. So um, that's provocative, but I don't think it, it I don't think it, you can connect it to Russia's sense that they, which they, which Putin used to justify the invasion, that, that unless we invade um, to create a buffer state and protect our Russians, as they would put it, NATO will, as Putin argued, have missile launchers in Kharkiv, which will be able to meet Moscow in 20 minutes. That was his argument. I don't think that, you know, provocative, but not, a, not cows us belly in, in any sense. So I wouldn't argue that. In terms of uh, American influence, I mean, look, uh, your comparison's not right because um, the Americans didn't invade Russia. 
<laughs> uh, Putin uh, might argue that they did effectively through their proxies, the Ukrainians. But, it, it, you know, he didn't inv uh, the Americans aren't threatening Russia as Napoleon and Hitler did. Although Putin is trying to use, you know, that as part of his, his, his propaganda. Um, but yes, I agree with you in, in, in the sense that um, at stake for uh, in this war and the goal of the Putin regime is to end what he sees and or constantly refers to as the um, you know the the unipolar world, the the world the international order dominated by America, um, and yeah, so um, supporting the Taliban, supporting Hamas possibly or certainly Iran, supporting. Um, uh, uh, move, uh, anti American movements across the globe, um, supporting nationalist uh, parties that uh, um, want uh, a, a more pro Russian line and, and, and less allegiance to NATO and the EU. Um, all of that is part of his, his war against the West. I mean, in a sense, it is now, it happens to be a war being fought in Ukraine and um, uh, by Ukraine. Ukrainians, but it's also, and perhaps more so now, really, a, a war of a Eurasian bloc of authoritarian nationalist states against the American-dominated Western world. So that's, yeah, I would agree with you on that. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for your lecture, first of all. Mm -hmm. So I am a Russian who is against the Russian government, and mm -hmm. I have seen the extent to which... Um, Russian culture has been indoctrinated to um, support uh, loyalty towards the government and the president, notably Putin. My uh, younger brothers are part of that category, and my father's part of that category. So my question to you is, could you see a possible deputunification of Russia or Russian culture in the near future? And if so, how would it occur? <laughs> Thank you. Wow, yeah. Um, well, we can discuss that uh, <laughs> all night. Um, I, 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 I mean, the problem is not, yeah, I mean, the problem is it's Putin isn't a one man system. It's a whole, a whole political elite which is bought into this ideology. Um, and, you know, even if you could sort of wave a magic wand in some post Putin world and have genuine democratic elections, the winners of the elections would probably continue the war. Um, and they certainly would refuse to give back Crimea, for example, probably the Donbass. So all of those are popular policies and policies that no um, politician in the political establishment would, you know, would oppose. So that's problem number one. Then the other problem is how do you tell a population that their understanding of their country's history is wrong and underpins their aggression and that they must learn to see the world differently. It's not, it's not something you can do from the outside. I mean, I had some experience with this myself in the 2000s when I, when I worked in Russia on, on, on a project about um, people's experience of the Stalin system and I went on a lecture tour of Russia to talk about my project with the memorial organization which was a big oral history of life under Stalin and the amount of hostility I got from from Russian academics who you know how dare you lecture us about our history sort of thing um, so I'm aware that that you know it's not something that can be done from the outside. We're not ever going to be in a situation like say, the, um, you know, the post 1945, you, you know, Western alliance having defeated Nazism, then sort of teaching the Germans how to be good, um, and making them feel guilty and very bad for a long time, and then they come out of it 20, 30 years later repentant and much the better for it. I mean, I think um, Germany is a pretty healthy democracy now, partly because it's had this re-evaluation of its history and come to terms with it all. I can't see that happening in Russia without 
you know, effectively having a whole set of having defeated the Russians and impose some sort of Nuremberg trial system on them, which is what the Ukrainians want, you know, drag them all off to the Hague uh, for war crimes trials and genocide trials and all the rest of it. You know, none of that's going to happen. Because even if Russia loses this war, and I don't really think that's very likely now, but even if there's a collapse of the... Then the regime's going to stay. And even if there are cracks in the regime and, and Putin and his group are replaced by maybe some people who are looking for a way of negotiating a peace to bring this to an end with minimal gains, like perhaps what they've conquered so far, with security guarantees for Ukraine that would be underwritten by, I don't know, the UN or the Americans. You know, even if there was some sort of more moderate faction of the Putin system that, that emerged out of that. That's, you know, that's not going to bring about the de-Putinization of Russia. So, yeah, it, it goes, I don't know how it's going to happen. I mean, it's, it's a great question. It, it's arguably the most important question. I think that, um, that, that Russia needs... Um, and, and I said this in, in, in June when I was in the European Parliament for a big conference of Russian opposition groups. Um, and I still would stick to it that Russia, it seems to me that Russia needs a different story to tell about itself. It's no good going on with this story that we're only great because we win wars, which is effectively their national story. <sighs> Look at the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians' national identity was built after 1991 on the Holodomor. We were victims of the Russians. They carried out a genocidal terror famine against us in the 1930s. We survived it. That is the core of our existence. Well, the thing is, the Russians had exactly the same thing. It was called collectivization. In some areas of Russia, it did more damage than it did in Ukraine. You know, the north of Russia, for example. So, um, but the Russians can't tell that story because they see collectivization as, you know, the eggs you have to break to make an omelette. They see collectivization as overall the right policy, although, you know, Millions of people perished as a result because it enabled the Soviet Union to industrialize and win the war. That's their story. It comes back to, we're great because we win the war. And that, that seems to me the core of the problem. There's, there's no story of Russia that they can tell themselves which, 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 can, which can come to terms with everything they went through since 1917, which is very traumatic, and which at the same time can, um, can give to Russian society an element of democratic thinking and responsibility. Because what collectivization did, which was so catastrophic for Russia, it destroyed the village, which was the basic unit of social life. And if you look at Ukraine now, you know, they have village committees because their villages, I mean, in Western Ukraine, collectivization was, was different. They already, already had uh, stronger villages. But I mean, you know, if you look at societies where collectivization happened, like Poland, Ukraine, they have people able to take responsibility through the basic unit of administration. All of that was wiped out in Russia. So there's no civic responsibility. There's no genuine element of democratic consciousness that can be used to build a new society with new ideas of citizenship. And that's the problem. So you've asked a question which I'm afraid, you know, I'll be dead before, before we see any light at the end of that tunnel. I'm sorry to be pessimistic. That question was almost... Uh the answer was almost another lecture. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. There's another question right here. Uh.
Hi, and thank you for the lecture. My question was uh, also partially answered. You mentioned the, those three scenarios as the outcome of the war, and I come from Ukraine. This is, um, thank you for your uh, sincere uh, opinion. But in those three scenarios, you mentioned um, uh, Putin as a president, uh, as far as I understood. So you think that his death is not going to change anything, uh, basically, because you also mentioned, and I do agree, that Russians are not active supporters of this war. So if Putin isn't physically there, do you think there, there might be an, another scenario? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I touched on this. If, if uh, that if, um, if, if Putin died, it, it, could, it could well be that there would be, um, you know, there are some people in the elite who are being quite quiet at the moment. And, you know, they're not coming out with, you know, sort of fascist statements about killing as many Ukrainians as possible and stuff like that. They're being quite quiet. So it might be, I mean, if Putin dropped dead, there could be a more moderate grouping that began to make more um, more more um, effort to bring around some sort of armistice talks or peace talks. It's possible, um, and. I think that what the Russians have taken of Ukrainian territory, if I can put it in a very insensitive way, but it, it would be enough for the political establishment to package as a victory. The problem is that even if Putin's dead and there are other people claiming now to be genuinely wanting peace. Can you trust them any more than you can trust Putin? If they've come out of the Putin system and are just uh, talking a slightly different language in order to bring the war to an end and stabilize their system without having to call more mobilizations. You know, I don't think the Ukrainian population would necessarily want to make a peace on that basis. Um, we'll see how the polling goes and suggest that, but any peace deal would, would, would require ratification by the Ukrainian parliament. So it's up to the Ukrainians in the end to decide what, what, what are the terms for peace. But there, there is a possibility of that, but I don't see it as um, likely at the moment and Putin that's, he looks pretty healthy to me. <laughs> Unfortunately. Good evening. Thank you very much for the lecture. I have two short questions. Um, first question is about Crimea. Could you please tell uh, us uh, for the last thousand years uh, how long of this period was Russia uh, having Crimea. And my second question is, uh, can you tell something about the attacks of Ukraine? I think it started in 2014, I'm not sure, on Donbass, and that it is because of these attacks on Donbass that the people of Donbass uh, use their right on self-determination to decide that they want to stop these attacks and that they wanted to become part of Russia because they mostly people who live there are also ethnic Russians. These are my two questions. Okay, so on the first, Crimea was annexed by Russia in 1786 under Catherine the Great. Until that time, it had been an independent Khanate, um, one of the offshoots of the Mongol Empire. Um, so it was brought into the Russian Empire. And um, in 1954, it was transferred from the uh, Russian Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic by Khrushchev in 1954. 
supposedly to mark the 300th anniversary of this union between Russia and Ukraine in 1654, although uh, the opening of the Soviet archives has now shown that actually the reason for it was that because Crimea had, in 1954, an absolute Russian majority, Russian-speaking strong majority, um, it would, by putting it into Ukraine, it would give Russia leverage over Ukraine. And that is relevant to the second question you raised, because Russia, you, Putin used um, the defense of Russian speakers in the Donbass um, as a justification to send in, well, here begins the controversy, because in the Putin narrative, which is shared by some people in the West, Yes, there were as a genuine threat to Russian speakers' interests in the Eastern territories, which is why they had voted for Yanukovych in the first place, who was a pro-Russian president unseated by the 2014 revolution in Kyiv. Um, but m m probably, as many people would argue, that um, the insurgency of the Russian speakers in the East was actually actually being carried out by Russians coming across the border, um, arming them, posing as, um, uh, as, as Ukrainians when they're in fact Russian. But, um, so yeah, that's as far as I can go with that, I think, yeah. Question here. Um, thank you, sir, for the, for the lecture. Um, I agree with you, we are maybe going for a 19th century uh, system. And so if so, if we are going for that and with uh, uh, close uh, alliances between, for example, China and, and Russia and, and an Atlantic uh, alliance with Japan and others, um, do you think uh, this system could end like the 19th cent uh, century system end, ended in 1914 with a, a small something happening, for example, in Taiwan triggering uh, a bigger war like in Sarajevo in, in 1914. Do you great. think that's a possible scenario? Thank you. Great, great question. I mean, I, I hate to sort of game play with history, but you're right that um, absolutely, I think we're moving into a, a world of, of big al of alliances which go along. It's a little bit like going back into George Orwell's 1984 when you have Eurasia fighting against Oceania. And both seem to need the war and the enemy to keep their systems going. Um, certainly for the Eurasian side in this, which, you know, we are seeing the formation of a block of Russia, Iran, China, North Korea, Libya, Wagner-controlled um, African states, um, against the American-dominated West. We are seeing that. And I think um, the reason why Zelensky says, with some, with some justification as a warning at least, that we are in danger of World War III is, is because Ukraine is now the place where this is being fought. And it's now escalated and I think there are definite connections between what's happening in uh, the Middle East um, and, and Ukraine. Um, the, you know, it, it's escalating so that if Iran gets drawn into this war, you know, and Iran also has interests in the Caucasus, for example, the Iranians are strongly allied to the Russians, then, you know, this is going to only make a local war, as you put it, in, which you could, I suppose, call Ukraine, but, um, actually be a war that runs right across this fault line, if you like, between you know, the, the Russian, Iranian, Chinese block of authoritarian states with an anti-American ideology trying to win over the global south against the Western democracies. We could, we could well be into that sphere, yeah. I think this is why... Um, we really are at an inflection point in history. You had a question here, Yap? Yeah, him. 
Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, my name is Wicke. Uh, I will present a bit of a Central European perspective because I lived in Poland for six years. Um, we talked a lot about how Russia see Russia, but we, my question is about how we see Russia. Because we in the West, we read Russian literature, we look at World War II as an American-Soviet alliance against Nazis. Um, rather than humiliating Putin uh, and Russia, we took them in the 90s and tried to come up with all these sources of cooperation, even Russia-NATO dialogue, etc. Yet still, you had the invasion of Georgia, you have 2014, you have MH17 uh, being shot down by separatist, uh, Russian separatists in Ukraine, and now, of course, um, 2022. So, in order for us to even change anything in this war, should we reconsider our view on Russia? Um, also, Another great question, yeah. Also, considering that post-war, there is a need to reconcile with the Russian people. Yeah. Um, is that possible? Also following up on the question from the gentleman earlier. And if so, um, on what basis should this be? On the basis that Russia can be a force for good or can be like us, or will always remain an imperial violent state that will attack again if you appease it again? This is my question. Thank you very much. Wow, okay, great questions. Um, there are several questions in there, aren't there? Um, uh, I think that uh, on the first point you made, I think, it, 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 I think that the problem with the way in the West we have seen Russia is, and I think that this war and the whole Putin phenomenon is a bracing uh, reminder of our fault in this. We have seen... We've tended to see Russia through the eyes of the Russians we like, which are nice Russian intellectuals um, who see their own country through Western eyes because they are Russian Europeans, Westerners. They want Russia to become Western. So they tended to overestimate their own significance. Turns out that they're completely insignificant. Um, and we overestimated their significance. So there was like a self-fulfilling thing going on here. We saw, we saw Russia through the eyes of the Russian intelligentsia, and the Russian intelligentsia saw their own country through our eyes. So we kept measuring Russia as to how far it would be westernized, become more like us. And we now have been reminded that a, that intelligence is tiny. No significance whatsoever anymore. Peasant Russia, if you like. I mean, you know, ordinary Russia. The Russia where they're, you know, all they have to go on is state TV. You know, there's, there's no running toilet. There's, you know, there, there's all sorts of problems of existence that would shock most people in this room if they encountered them. That Russia is the Russia we need to reevaluate. Um, but it seems to me, to come to the main point of your second question, that, that, yeah, there's nothing in the DNA of the Russians that makes them uh, slaves, or that makes them Tsar worshippers, or that makes them uh, support aggressive expansionist states. They don't have to do that. Most Russians, if you actually sat down and talked with them, just want what they would call a normal life, like the rest of us. So, uh, you know, we have to work on that assumption. Um, but that means that uh, to get them to the point where they would be more pro-Western or pro-democracy or vote for politicians who don't uh, want aggressive wars or feed them propaganda. You know, you need, you need to build up all those institutions of society so that they can, and above all, I think in some ways you have to start with history because they need, they need to have a, um, 
a, a narrative. They need to have a structure to understand their own experience. You know, just, I mean, just go back to the war. I mean, the war, the Second World War is so important in Russian propaganda, but also in Russian consciousness. When, when I did my work with Memorial, um, we interviewed people who experienced the war, and others uh, uh, who've worked on the war have this experience that, you know, you can interview a war veteran, and they have experienced the most traumatic war. They've seen their comrades executed by their own officers for not going forward, as they're doing now in Ukraine, according to American intelligence. You know, they've had traumatic personal experiences, but the only way they can explain and make sense of those experiences is by explaining them in terms of the, the, the big Soviet narrative. Yeah? It was uh, defense against Nazism. It was, um, you know, it was all for uh, the great national sacrifice and so on. They, so... This is the problem. They don't, Russians need a, a different historical narrative in which to question the uh, authority as well as make sense of their own experience. But once they have that, it seems to me there's no reason why they shouldn't become more peaceful, happier, and actually live better lives because they're electing politicians who are not crooks and thieves and dictators, but actually have the interests of the people at heart. So, you know, there's, there's hope for that, um, for that reason. It seems like with every interesting question and interesting answer, it gets more and more interesting, <laughs> and there's more and more hands, but we only have one left, one question in the back. Time for one question. Then. Before we finish. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask if you have any hope for the March 2024 elections? Because, I mean, of course, obviously, Putin will win a landslide election, quote-unquote, but do you see perhaps an uprising or people saying, okay, enough and is enough, and maybe making some kind of significant uprising that can topple the government, perhaps? Um, no, really. I mean, um, as I said, um, I mean, m my hope for for the summer was that uh, the counter-offensive by the Ukrainians um, might lead to a, some sort of military collapse and soldiers going home and saying, you know, what they're telling us is a pack of lies. We're not fighting Nazis, we're fighting ordinary people. Um, and, and that might spark something, some demonstrations. But at the moment, I can't see that. It would take a lot more deaths and a few more mobilizations, not just from Dagestan and Siberia, but mobilizations of people in European Russia, so to speak, for um, this sort of Afghanistan effect to have any impact on politics. Um, and, you know, any sign of street protests, if it's not, you know, an anti-Jewish pogrom on an airport tarmac, um, any other sign of demonstrations by people, you know, gets crushed pretty quickly. Um, there was a moment when that could have happened. I mean, it was the demonstrations on Bolotna Square in the center of Moscow in 2011-12 against, you know, the corruption of the regime, the gerrymandering and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, when that was repressed, every, the opposition scurried away into the world of the internet uh, to continue opposition. And now they don't even have the internet anymore. I mean, they have, they have Telegram, but um, I think that the Russians now have the artificial intelligence needed to crack Telegram. But it, their suppression of Telegram doesn't work like that. The reason why... Um, opposition is uh, not able to organize even through Telegram and other channels like that is that they have that so, there are so many random arrests on the street and there are secret laws and you can be in prison for secret laws which um, disqualify you from having legal representation 
And the first thing they do when they arrest you is they go to your phone and go through your telegram channel. So they don't need the artificial intelligence to crack it. They don't mind people using telegram. But, um, you know, as soon as the people using telegram then went onto the streets to organize protests, their whole network would be completely broken because the arrests would lead to all their contacts on Telegram. So, yeah, I can't see how street protests would be organized, let alone how they would sustain themselves against um, brutal repression, sadly. It is sadly that we do have to finish with uh, not really an a optimistic... Yeah, I can't be optimistic um, at the moment. I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> understandable. Um, I do want to thank you also in name of the board of our university for this very interesting Dr. Yetan's lecture 2023. Thank you, thank thank you. for coming, Orlando Vajas. I thank, thank you. you all for coming to this lecture and for the interesting questions. Yeah. And I do invite you for drinks in the after if you go out the door on the back to the right. And the books, you can buy the books. Books! <laughs> It is said that the, the bags are free, but they're plastic. <laughs> it's raining outside.